Okay, good morning. I think we should get started with episode two of Policy School. Hello and welcome. My name's Alice Grundy. I'm a research manager here at the Australia Institute, and I'm coming to you from beautiful Ngunnawal and Ngambri country. This country was never ceded, sovereignty was never ceded, it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And welcome to everyone tuning in uh, from around Australia on whichever country you're on right now. So we're up to the second class of policy school and in each session you'll be hearing from policy experts from the Australia Institute who will take you through the most important policy issues like fair tax, electoral reform, the Australia-US relationship, the housing crisis or reducing greenhouse gas emissions. You'll learn about key issues and the current policy debate, what the evidence-based research shows, the most persuasive arguments and key messages, and how to communicate cut through facts and data to help you change minds. At the end of policy school, you'll be able to confidently advocate for what needs to be done, explain why it needs to be done, and how we can all work together to achieve a more just, sustainable, and peaceful society. So a few reminders, you can type questions for Bill using the Q&A box, uh, and you can upvote other people's questions if you think they've asked something that's particularly interesting. Um, you can also uh, communicate in the chat. Um, you could ask a question about something that you'd like more detail on. Just remember to keep things civil, otherwise we'll kick you out of the chat. And lastly, this is a live event and it is being recorded. The video will be available afterwards on our website, australiainstitute.org.au. So in this episode, we have the director of the Australia Institute's Democracy and Accountability Program, Bill Brown, talking about how parliament share power when no single party has majority control. Bill's diverse areas of interest include the use of opinion polling, of forecasting to predict policy outcomes, truth in political advertising reforms, digital technology, and the role of the states and the Senate in Australian democracy. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. I'll kick off. Um, so the topic, how parliaments share power when no one party has majority control. It looks more likely than not that the next federal election will return a hung parliament in which no one party has majority control. Last month, respected pollster Redbridge reported, we are now firmly in minority government territory. And while focus has been on the chance of a minority Labor government under Prime Minister Anthony Albanese, Journalist Phil Khoury reports recent polling gives Peter Dutton a fighting chance of negotiating supply and confidence for a minority coalition government. These parliaments, called hung parliaments or balanced parliaments, have been somewhat rare at the federal level, which means people are less familiar with how they work. Knowing how parliaments and government work is essential, not just for community advocates and researchers, but for every citizen and resident of Australia who is affected by policy and laws and who, through voting, gets to decide who makes those policies and laws. This talk is designed to answer five questions. Are parliaments and governments expected to share power? What kind of power sharing can Australians expect after the next election? Why is a hung parliament and power sharing arrangements likely? How will politics work differently if no one party has majority control? And should Australians be wary of power sharing parliaments and governments? Understanding how Australian politics works is important for advocacy and accountability. The Australia Institute prides itself on its understanding of how parliament operates. Advocacy for reform is strongest when it is grounded in an understanding of who to talk to and where to apply pressure. And we cannot hold decision makers to account until we understand what is and what is not within their powers. Fortunately, we have a wealth of examples of power sharing parliaments and governments that can teach us what to expect and demonstrate that parliaments that force the government to share power can work very well and in some cases can work better than majority governments do. So to the first question, are parliaments and governments expected to share power? To answer this question, we have to go back to the role that parliaments play in the formation of governments. Many of you will already know these basics, 
But I'm starting here because power sharing is a function of how parliaments work, even under majority control. So the Australian government is a Labor government, with Prime Minister Anthony Albanese at its head. Albanese leads a cabinet of 23 ministers. You have Jim Chalmers, the treasurer, Penny Wong, the foreign minister, Mark Dreyfus, the attorney general, and so on. Some are senators, some are members of the House of Representatives, but all belong to the Australian Labor Party. Before the Albanese Labor government, there was the Morrison Coalition government with Prime Minister Scott Morrison. And why did it change? Because at the 2022 federal election, the Labor Party won a majority of seats in the House of Representatives, which is one of the two houses of parliament. Simplifying things a little, the Parliament of Australia makes the laws and the Australian government puts the laws into action. There are two houses of parliament, the House of Representatives, with about 150 electorates, each choosing one local representative, and the Senate, with each state and territory choosing several representatives. And in Australia's Westminster system, which we borrow from the United Kingdom, we do not elect the government. We don't have any equivalent to the presidential election campaign going on in the United States at the moment between Donald Trump and Kamala Harris. Australians elect the parliament and one house of parliament, the House of Representatives, decides, decides who forms or stays in government. And the moment that the government loses the confidence of the democratically elected members of parliament, they fall and a new government must be chosen. These basics illuminate a very important point. Power sharing is a built-in function of our system of government. And this is not an accident. Wars have been fought over the sharing of power between King and Parliament. England, and later the United Kingdom, experienced with parliaments for close to a thousand years. And the result is a model where power is shared even if one party has a majority of the seats. The Prime Minister holds power only with the consent of his or her party room, the elected MPs and senators of that party. And that means that factions and groups in that party room must decide on how to share power, including ministerial positions like those in the cabinet. The Prime Minister also shares power with his or her ministers. And the House of Representatives shares lawmaking power with the Senate. A single MP or senator can be the casting vote on whether Australian law changes or stays the same. And you only get to become or remain a party MP or senator with the support of your party and its membership. Most of this power sharing within parties is invisible to us. Political parties, particularly in Australia, are disciplined and do most of their negotiating and fighting behind closed doors. The result is presented to us as a united effort from the party and government. But make no mistake that the united effort that we see is the product of shared power. So the answer to the question, are parliaments and governments expected to share power, is a resounding yes. Parliaments exist to force the government to share power. And Australia's Westminster system of government expects power to be shared widely. But if you've read about the diabolical prospect of minority government, to quote one newspaper, or had someone try to worry you about the chaos of a hung parliament, you'll have a sense that people are more interested in and more alarmed by some forms of power sharing, specifically those arising from a hung parliament. So that brings us to the question, what kind of power sharing can we expect after the next election? A hung parliament sometimes called a balanced parliament, describes when no one party wins a majority of seats in the House of Representatives, the lower house of the Parliament of Australia. And since the government needs the confidence or the support of a majority of the House of Representatives, they must negotiate with other parties or independent MPs who hold what we call the balance of power on the crossbench between the government and the opposition. A hung parliament can be resolved in two ways. A coalition government, where parties make a formal agreement to share power. Usually this involves the junior, the smaller party or parties, taking positions as ministers in the cabinet. Or resolved via a minority government, where the party and government 
relies on the ongoing support of crossbenchers without bringing those crossbenchers into the government. They keep that distinction between the parliament and the government. The most successful power sharing arrangement in Australian history is the coalition agreement between the Liberal Party and their junior party, the Nationals. So enduring is this coalition that many treat the coalition with a capital C as a single major party. But in truth, the Liberals and Nationals are different parties with different priorities. And the coalition agreement is regularly renegotiated and recreated as power and priorities shift between the two party rooms. But the Liberals and Nationals do not have a monopoly on coalition governments with a lowercase c. There has been a Labor-Greens coalition government in the ACT since 2012. And even a coalition government can be a minority government. The Morrison government went into minority twice. In other words, even the Liberals and Nationals together did not have a majority and they needed to rely on independents and minor parties for that confidence. So when we talk about a Dutton minority government, this is what would be happening again, a Liberal National Coalition that also depends on crossbencher support in the House of Representatives. The Australia Institute calculates 17 minority governments in Australia across the last 20 years at the state and federal levels and about a dozen more coalition governments. You have lived under governments of this nature. So what's the record? Has there been chaos? Well, if we start with the best known federal minority government in recent years, the Gillard Labor government, which operated between 2010 and 2013, the Gillard minority government passed over 500 pieces of legislation, the highest daily rate of any Australian government. And that includes difficult reforms such as the Clean Energy Act, the Minerals Resource Rent Tax and the National Disability Insurance Scheme. By contrast, the Albanese government, though it's a, minor, it's a majority government, has passed fewer than 300 pieces of legislation so far. And even Labor's rivals have recognised the effectiveness of this particular power sharing government, with former Liberal opposition leader John Hewson saying, Indeed, one measure of the success of the minority government formed by Julia Gillard was its legislative agenda, with record numbers of bills passed during her term. A more recent minority government is that of the Rockliffe Liberal minority government in Tasmania, at the 2024 election this year, the Rockliffe Liberal government won 14 seats, three short of a majority. Greens, Jackie Lambie network candidates and independents won 11 seats between them, more than the Labor opposition did. Crossbench MPs offered Premier Rockliffe confidence and supply. The Rockliffe government had been in minority previously, but as a result of defections, this time in a, it's in a minority as a result of an election. And on election night, we heard from the then Labor opposition leader, Rebecca White, who said it is very likely that Tasmania will continue to elect minority governments. These kinds of power sharing arrangements are here to stay. And in fact, Australia's largest state, New South Wales, also has power sharing government. The Berejiklian coalition government fell into minority in 2021 and remained in minority when Gladys Berejiklian was replaced as Premier by Dominic Perrottet. After the 2023 election, Labor won the most seats, but not a majority. Voters in New South Wales gave the crossbench the balance of power in the lower house. So Labor took government with the confidence of crossbenchers. And in New South Wales, Independent Alex Greenwich has been behind the decriminalisation of abortion, fairer spending caps for independent candidates and the legalisation of voluntary assisted dying. So stable is power sharing government that many New South Wales residents do not even realise that they are living under a minority government and have been for about four years now. And then we turn to the question of coalition governments involving the Greens. In the Australian Capital Territory, after a 2008 to 2012 minority government with Green support, Chief Minister Katie Gallagher invited Greens MP Shane Rattenbury to become a minister in her government as part of a formal coalition. 
the Gallagher Bar government is by far the nation's longest standing government here in the ACT. And most of that period has been in minority or coalition power sharing government. Australia Institute polling research finds strong support across the country for policies in, from this period adopted in the ACT. 84% of Australians support spending on programs to reduce youth crime and incarceration, what's also known as justice reinvestment. 64% support pill testing at music festivals, a successful ACT policy that's now seriously entertained or adopted in other states because of its proven success. The stamp duty to land tax swap has the support of 60% of Australians, despite it being a controversial, long-term and difficult policy to implement. And our polling also finds strong national support for other ACT policies, such as decriminalising marijuana. And the example of, ACE, of the ACT shows us that minority party and independent MPs can govern well. Uh, in the Canberra Times, journalist Jasper Lindell wrote that one suggestion to improve the chances of the Canberra Liberals is to borrow from the vibe of Greens leader Shane Rattenbury, the earnest, serious bureaucrat. So here is a conservative major party, what we normally call one of the parties of government, being urged to emulate a progressive minor party politician if it wants to appear ready to govern. So to return the question of what kind of power sharing can we expect after the next federal election? Well, if no party emerges with majority control of the House of Representatives, if there is a hung parliament, then the crossbench and major parties will negotiate, just as they have in the ACT, in Tasmania, in New South Wales, just as they did during the Gillard government, just as they did in those 17 minority governments Australia has had over the last 20 years, state and federal, and just as they do in countries all around the world. So that brings us to the question of why are we anticipating a hung parliament? Why do we consider hung parliaments and power sharing arrangements likely? In practice, simply because people keep voting for them. The share of Australians voting outside of the major parties has increased from 4% in 1949 to 31% at the most recent election in 2022. That puts the combined independent minor party vote almost as high as the coalition vote on 36% and the Labor vote at 33%. In fact, you have to go back to 1975 to find a federal election where a majority of Australians voted for either the coalition or Labor. So the influence of the crossbench, even in a power sharing parliament, does not exceed its share of the vote. Quite the opposite. In the House of Representatives, the major parties typically win far more seats than their primary vote would suggest. So why is it likely that at the next federal election, no party will have majority control? Well, because the major party vote has been declining for decades and no single party has received a majority of the vote since 1975. A power sharing parliament would be a reflection of the will of voters. If we're expecting a hung parliament as a serious possibility, how would we expect politics to work differently if no party has majority control of the House of Representatives? Well, at the outset, it's important to note the single biggest difference which is that the crossbench in the House of Representatives could, in collaboration with the opposition, bring down the government of the day. This is the single greatest difference between a crossbench balance of power in the Senate, the upper house, and a, the crossbench balance of power in the House of Representatives. But in practice, does our experience of minority government, coalition government, these power sharing governments, suggest that this possibility is likely? It does not. In practice, we have seen the crossbenchers force the resignation of a premier, which is the state equivalent of the prime minister, or a minister, but with their replacement typically chosen from within the same party. So the government continues, even as individuals are held accountable by the parliament. The second uh, possibility, the second additional outcome, 
is that the crossbench would be in a position to block government legislation in the House of Representatives, stop the proposed laws of the government from getting through that House of Parliament. But it's already the case that if the crossbench has the balance of power in the upper house, the Senate, that's already true. To pass a law today, the Albanese Labor government, though it's a majority government, needs 39 votes out of 76 in the Senate. They have 25 Labor senators. To get to 39, they need the 30 opposition senators, or they need 11 Greens and three of the 10 crossbench senators. In Australia, this is normal. Among the parliaments that we have, that have two houses of parliament, it's very rare that one party has a majority in both houses. The next uh, serious possibility is that the crossbench could, with the opposition, pass its own or the opposition's legislation. So it would not be only the government of the day that is able to pass laws, provided that the crossbench and opposition in the House of Representatives and the Senate supported those laws. It's already the case that the hung parliament elected in Tasmania this year has passed what we call private members bills, these bills that don't come from the government. One from the Labor opposition on industrial manslaughter and one from the Greens decriminalising begging. And during the Morrison minority government, uh, legislation allowing for medical evacuation for refugees and asylum seekers passed um, thanks to that power sharing parliament. In New South Wales, which as we established has had power sharing parliament for some time now, um, another possibility emerges where the government, aware that the crossbench and opposition together could pass legislation, um, allows more conscience votes on legislation, stops enforcing that strict party line. The consequence is that you see legislation passing with bipartisan and crossbench support. And finally, a prominent House of Representatives crossbench can prompt major party MPs to be more outspoken. When they witness independent and minor party MPs striking positions informed by their own conscience and by the positions supported by their constituents, it can be a spur for major party politicians to do the same. And it's been suggested that we've already seen this happening in the Albanese government partly as a consequence of the large size of the House of Representatives crossbench, even though that crossbench does not currently hold um, the balance of power. But I think from these four examples, what emerges is a common theme. A power sharing parliament is one where parliament exercises the powers and functions that it was always intended to have, holding ministers responsible for their actions, deliberating on legislation not waving it through, provoking MPs to speak about the particular concerns of their electorate and allowing for any representative of the people to propose changes in the law that are seriously discussed and entertained. So knowing this, should Australians be wary of power sharing parliaments and governments? I think not. And the first reason why is that it's still the case that the major parties give the crossbench its power. Uh, Fred Cheney, who's a former deputy leader of the Liberal Party, wrote 24 years ago in 2000, already anticipating some of this change. The thing to remember is that any single Liberal, National or Labor senator could be pivotal in the case of a close vote. In the 1970s, when senators on the conservative side were less bound by party discipline, they often used their power across the floor to achieve the same apparent dominance in the decision-making process as Colston and Haradine. So that's two more recent crossbench senators who had uh, particular influence on the passage of legislation because of their balance of power position. So the point that Fred Cheney is making here is that if major party MPs and senators were prepared to cross the floor more often, then they would force the crossbench to share its power with rogue or maverick opposition backbenchers, just as the crossbench was forced to do when Barnaby Joyce, then a senator, crossed the floor 28 times. And it's also the case that for the foreseeable future, the Labor and Liberal parties will always have the numbers voting together to override the crossbench. I think this is an important point. Any time 
you see the crossbench exercising its powers that is in collaboration with one of the major parties. A major party has let them exercise that power. So if major parties are concerned about the crossbench, they could weaken the power of independents and minor parties by relaxing major party discipline or by prioritizing bipartisanship. But I think we can go further than this and note that when major party politicians get a taste of power sharing government, they can be glowing in their praise. This might be surprising because we're used to dark warnings about minority government. In July, The Australian editorialized that the potential for a minority Labor government that relied on the Greens is a diabolical prospect. The Greens were the kiss of death for the Gillard government, and they have become only more extreme. And before the last election, Scott Morrison and Josh Frydenberg warned that voting for independence could lead to the chaos of a hung parliament. But in our real world examples, we see neither diabolical outcomes nor chaos. We see large amounts of legislation being passed. And in fact, when major party politicians get a taste of power sharing government, they're often effusive in their praise. Dominic Perrottet, on becoming Premier of New South Wales, inheriting a minority government, was asked about this issue. And his reply was, that's what we have in a democracy. And it means you work closer with the independents and with the crossbench to get legislation through. And if what you're doing is right, you can bring parliamentarians on the journey. And for a more recent example, Liberal Premier Jeremy Rockliffe, reflecting on the parliament elected this year, has said, the parliament has been effective and productive since the election. This is a parliament where the crossbench is larger than the opposition and almost as large as the government, and yet it's been effective and productive. So how does that compare to recent reporting in The Australian, uh, reporting that Peter Dutton will warn that the economy and resources sector will be smashed if the Teals or Greens help Labor cling to minority government, promising mining chiefs a coalition government would be the best friend they've had, as senior mining figures privately declare a hung parliament would be an unmitigated disaster. But nobody thinks that a majority coalition government is likely. If there is a Dutton government, it will likely be a minority government with the confidence of at least some of those same independents who would supposedly make a Labour minority government an unmitigated disaster. I started this presentation with five questions. Let's return to them. Are parliaments and governments expected to share power? Yes, parliaments exist to force the government to share power and Australia's Westminster system of government expects power to be shared widely. What kind of power sharing can Australians expect after the next election? If there is a balanced parliament, then major parties, minor parties and independents will negotiate, just as they have in the other 30 or so minority and coalition governments Australians have had in the past two decades. And why are a hung parliament and power sharing arrangements likely? In short, because more Australians are voting for independents and minor parties. And you have to go back to 1975 to find an election where either the coalition or Labor won a majority of the primary vote. A power sharing parliament would be a reflection of the will of voters. And how will politics work differently if no one party has majority control? It's quite possible that we'll see a more active parliament but that parliament will be exercising the powers and functions that it is intended to have, uh, enforcing ministerial responsibility, encouraging deliberation and debate on legislation, and seeing MPs speaking out about the particular concerns of their electorates. And finally, should Australians be wary of power sharing parliaments and governments? I don't think so. The major parties give the crossbench its power, and major party politicians who get a taste for power sharing parliaments are often glowing in their praise. There is no reason to expect that Australians will elect a dangerous or chaotic parliament, regardless of whether the result of our democratic elections is a majority party controlled parliament or one in which the crossbench holds the balance of power 
in the House of Representatives. The historical and current day evidence is clear. All parliaments share power. Some of Australia's most successful governments are those in which power is shared more widely. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, we have some questions already uh, waiting for you in the chat. The first one is from Michelle Smith, and she asks, what do you think about parliamentarians doing deals involving trade-offs? Um, by that, she means voting for something you don't really agree with in order to make progress on another issue. Shouldn't all parliamentarians vote according to the merits of each and every issue? It's a difficult question, and I think it's a, a fair one to ask of those who are are seeking the support of voters. Um, the reality is that politics does require compromise. And what I'd like to see is parliamentarians being explicit and open about those compromises, uh, making it clear what the choice was, what their decision making was, and how that negotiation process played out. I think in some ways we see that more often in power sharing parliaments uh, because the distinction in uh, negotiations is clearer and more of it is likely to happen out in the open. Um, but it's also true that we want our parliamentarians to make uh, thoughtful decisions about each piece of legislation that's in front of them. And people are understandably skeptical about horse trading. Um, you used the expression out in the open in your answer to that question. And the next question, which comes from Tim Diamond, I think follows on or relates to that. He's, he asks, do you think that an agreement such as the Lib and National um, Coalition document should be made publicly available? Should the law compel parties to release such agreements, even though they are legally speaking agreements between private clubs? Hmm. Uh, so there's uh, at least two kind of questions there, whether I think the agreement should be public um, and whether I think law should enforce the making public of that agreement. Uh, my inclination is always towards more transparency. And I think it would be good uh, for Australians to be able to see the details and nature of the coalition agreement. Um, during the Morrison government, we uh, saw considerations about the coalition agreement brought into stark relief um, with uh, the kind of ability of the Prime Minister to, to give or take away National Party ministries in relation to Scott Morrison and his uh, appointing himself to, to multiple ministries. Knowing exactly what was in the agreement, I think, would allow us to understand better what was going on then and in other cases where we see the the National Party or the Liberal Party kind of um, make decisions on the basis of, of those negotiations. But of course, ultimately, it's the choice of Australian voters whether they want to to cast their votes for parties that that keep their agreements secret. Uh, there's also been coalitions that have published their agreements. Um, I'm thinking at least of the the Labor Greens coalition in the ACT. Um, but I think, it, uh, well, actually also the Gillard minority government saw the publishing of uh, agreements with independents and Greens and the Labor government. And that was really interesting too, to be able to assess the success uh, and the failures of minority government in that period, because we had spelled out very clearly uh, exactly what was being sought by each of the people involved in that negotiation. Finally, um, I think another argument against enforcing anything in, in legal terms is how you'd actually be able to enforce that in practice. Um, I don't think you'd ever be able to get away around the fact that um, these negotiations are to some extent ad hoc and are regularly up for renegotiation and wouldn't necessarily be able to distinguish between the written agreement between coalition partners and the more informal negotiations that were ongoing. I, I can see there are a couple of hands up, but if you could please type out your question to pop it in the chat, that way um, it's easier for us to answer it. The next question comes from David Carr, who is assuming that there is an impending federal hung parliament. Uh, he asks, do you think there will be more free votes by party members, those uh, conscience votes that you were speaking about earlier? Hmm. There have been some people... Uh, in the Labor Party who've been contemplating relaxing the strict 
party discipline in the Labour Party. Um, the Liberal and National Parties, uh, and for, in most cases the Greens, are less strict about enforcing voting along party lines, although in practice, as you saw from that quote from Fred Cheney, um, party discipline remains very strong uh, with a few uh, other examples. Uh, I think if there is increased success for independents and minor parties, um, that will provoke more thought among the major parties about how they want to negotiate the, you know, the, those details. Um, but it should be noted as well well, that, that party discipline and labour solidarity has been a distinctive feature of the party during its entire history since Federation. Um, and to some extent, it's been the success of that model of party solidarity um, that has led uh, the coalition to, to imitate, not wholly, but to be itself much stricter in discipline. Um, because if you're always facing a party that votes along party lines, you can feel like a sucker if your own people are, are prepared to vote with the party when it doesn't allow its members to, to do the same in return. Um, so I think it will be likely that we see more pressure for more conscience votes, um, but we shouldn't neglect the kind of strong historical weight behind party discipline in this country. Um, there's a question from Lorraine Bull on party discipline, and um, she's asking whether it's a good idea for um, the opinion of the electorate to be able to override obligation to party policy for individual members. Can you comment on that? Mm. Yeah, I, I think it's um, a, a very natural kind of trade-off, one in which reasonable people could disagree. Um, and I think there's good reason behind the idea that uh, if you're offering a candidate as a member of a party um, elected based on a platform that's that's public for that party ahead of time, um, you expect them to vote in line with that platform. Uh, but in practice, I think we've also seen plenty of examples where crossing the floor um, or voting against the party line can actually be as true or more true to either the principles of that party or its party platform than towing the party line. And that's where you get to the kind of difference between the decisions of the party as a government, the decisions of the party room, and the decisions of the party as the rank and file uh, that debates party platforms and so on. Um, so I, I think people can reasonably disagree about this. Uh, but it's also true that um, at least some voters are voting with their feet and are choosing candidates in part because they're not bound by strict party discipline. Uh, and that's something Malcolm Turnbull acknowledged, that um, party discipline does make independence, not bound by that discipline, a more attractive prospect, at least in some electorates and at least for some voters. Mm. Um, on a related point, Paul Loring uh, asks, although the Greens are credited with using consensus within to develop their policies, they don't appear to have that consensus flexibility when negotiating within Parliament. Would you think that's a true statement? I guess I, I don't know how the Greens party room functions, um, so I'm reluctant to kind of speculate. Um, I think there'll be an interesting area for for more study, but I don't know to what extent it's down to the dynamics of, of the party, its nature as the largest minor party, its nature as a crossbench party. I'm afraid I'm just not sure. Our next question comes from Jaden Ogueo, who asks, by empowering independent crossbenchers, are hung parliaments better for young people keen to enter politics who feel disengaged by the major parties? Hmm. I think... Uh, for any voter who feels disengaged by the minor parties, a hung parliament is likely to be an attractive prospect. Um, of course, that would depend in part on the, the makeup of the hung parliament. Um, we have seen in Australia a, a recent growth, as I mentioned, in more people voting for minor parties and independents. But of course, our electoral system is an ecosystem, uh, one in which Every political player is reacting to events. Um, and 
It's true that in the past we've had more relaxed party systems, including at federation. Um, and it's ebbed and flowed. It's shifted between two-party and more multi-party government, and it's shifted between stricter and less strict party discipline. Um, so one option is that the major parties could react to this growing minor party and independent vote. There's a few ways they could react. One often stated concern is that the two major parties together um, could vote on electoral law provisions and political finance provisions that advantage major parties at the expense of minor parties and independents. Um, but it's also the case that the major parties could adapt and could offer more of the kinds of things that people like to see from minor parties and independents and reclaim some of the vote that way. And you mentioned that a lot of um, the political sphere is about reactions to different kinds of uh, inputs. And I suppose the media is another one. There are a couple of questions about the media. We have one from Kate Crawford asking, do you think in the current era, power sharing and debate in parliament could also result in better informed voters and improve consensus building processes in the media? Hmm. I think it can be the case that power sharing parliaments um, draw out, because they draw out more of those negotiations and more of uh, the struggle over how power is shared, um, that you see more public statement of where disagreements lie and why compromise has or hasn't been reached in particular cases. I guess even looking at Senate debate over legislation that's been proposed under the Albanese government, um, you can see both Labor and the Greens, and in fact the coalition, starkly outlining differences on policy as well as philosophy. And I think it's helpful to have journalists reporting the nature of those policy debates, um, not just be tempted to look at electoral politics as, as a horse race um, between the two major parties. Um, so I think there, there are definitely possibilities there, thanks in part to the role of parliament as uh, an organ of debate, as a place in which arguments are put about what the direction of the country is and should be. Uh, we have a question from Anastasia Davy about whether there's a risk that Australia might end up with a system like America, where politicians have to negotiate individually with each senator to pass legislation. Do you think there's a chance of that happening? I think uh, it's unlikely that Australian democracy will uh, move particularly close to what we see in the United States, um, in part just because of our different histories, our different approaches, uh, but also because we, we have the proven record of how power-sharing parliaments have functioned in Australia so far. And I think what we've seen is that that hasn't emerged, even in cases where there's been uh, minority or coalition government. Um, where that negotiation with individual parliamentarians draws out real differences on the legislation at hand, though, I think that can be healthy. Um, it will be the case that there are many different perspectives on any single piece of legislation. And having enough diversity of voices in the parliament that multiple of those differing views are articulated, I think could help improve the quality of legislation. And of course, there's always the option for voters to judge um, both crossbenchers and major party politicians at the next election based on how well or how poorly they're seen to negotiate. We have a question from S. Madison. What role can you see the next Senate playing if private members' bills were successfully put up by independents during a possible minority coalition government? Hmm. I, I guess that would depend in part on the makeup of the crossbench um, in the Senate. Uh, I think everyone expects that the Senate crossbench will continue to hold the balance of power. Um, but where that power lies, for example, whether the coalition government can get to a majority without the Greens, um, with other crossbenchers instead, um, would go a way to explaining kind of what role the Senate would end up playing. Uh, it's been an observation made from New South Wales, which had a very large uh, 
upper house crossbench in, I think, the 90s, maybe the early 2000s under Bob Carr's government, um, that having a large Senate crossbench, a large upper house crossbench, can actually increase the government's negotiating options um, because you have multiple sets of independents that you can work through to get your legislation passed. Um, we saw something similar in the large crossbenches that we saw uh, after the 2016 double dissolution election in the upper house, um, where there are actually a few different passages for the coalition government to get legislation passed through the Senate. Um, but I think regardless of what the particular makeup of the crossbench is, what we've seen is that crossbenches as a set tend to have certain interests in common. One of those is the function of parliament and parliamentary processes. Um, so more possibilities for private members bills, non-government bills to get up for debate and discussion and possibly also for vote and passage. Um, another is uh, changing the nature of parliamentary debate. It's not a coincidence, for example, that in the Senate, uh, question time includes supplementary questions. So after you've put your original question to the, the minister, you can ask follow-up questions and really press them. And I've seen this play out myself with Australia Institute research that um, the then Labor opposition put to Liberal ministers in the House of Representatives and the Senate. This is before the last election. And in the House of Representatives, there was a single answer that I wasn't particularly satisfied by, and that's where the line of inquiry ended. But with supplementary questions in the Senate, uh, those questions could follow up and keep pressing the minister responsible to come back to the topic, um, which is a long way of saying that I think what we can expect uh, is if the crossbench does hold the balance of power, we might see the House of Representatives um, also taking on some of the functions that we traditionally associate with the Senate, whether that's uh, debating private members' bills, uh, demanding documents of the government, um, holding government to account through questioning. So we have Senate estimates, but no real equivalent in the House of Representatives. We have a question from Claire Bettington about uh, the forthcoming rules for donations and spending, uh, which the TEAL say will stop or severely hamper independents from becoming MPs. Do you have comments about that? Mm. Um, changes to how political finance laws work are extremely fraught and need to be carefully considered. Even well-meaning changes um, can end up having perverse outcomes. And we see that at the state and territory level, um, where over the last 10 years, we've seen several states adopt some combination of increased taxpayer funding for political parties and candidates, um, caps on how much money can be spent, uh, and caps on how much money can be donated to political parties. Um, the nature of how public funding works in Australia is that it overwhelmingly advantages incumbents at the expense of new entrants. There are alternative systems you can devise. The Australia Institute has published research about democracy vouchers, for example, um, but that's not the model that's been adopted so far. It's also the case that donation caps harm those that are more dependent on donations versus those that have other revenue streams. Um, so particularly the major parties have had decades to accumulate assets. And so they have spending power that's not linked to donations. Whereas any new challenger has limited options in how money can be raised. Uh, in Victoria, for example, we see more money going to the Labor Party from levies on its own members of parliament and their staff than donations from the other 6 million Victorians. Um, so I think any changes should be carefully scrutinised. Uh, the good news is that we do know that there are some political reforms that work and we would be able to implement them before the next election. So we already have a donation disclosure scheme. It's just that it has loopholes and the threshold for disclosure is about $15,000. When you can buy dinner with a prime minister, minister or premier for about $10,000, or even less, 
um, it's way too high to have $15,000 as the threshold. But you could lower that threshold and just use the existing donation infrastructure and disclosure requirements that we have. Similarly, bringing in real-time disclosure requirements so that we find out about donations more quickly instead of waiting up to 18 months. And finally, truth and political advertising laws, which the Albanese government has committed to and which the opposition leader, Peter Dutton, has cautiously welcomed. We know from South Australia there is a working model for these laws. And Australia Institute polling research finds that the vast majority of Australians want those laws in place for the next election. So we could start there, bring in truth and transparency, and then after the election, contemplate what changes are possible with the extra knowledge we'd have about how political parties and candidates are funded. Mm. Um, we're nearly out of time, so we'll come to the last question, which is a combination of uh, two people's comments, one from Tim Diamond and one from Paul Loring. Um, effectively, the mainstream media, uh, as indicated by your talk, says that the prospect of a hung parliament or a balanced parliament, whatever we decide to call it, is potentially catastrophic. What kinds of steps do you think people can take to try to change the narrative if the mainstream media is pushing um, the catastrophizing so hard? I guess our hope with these policy schools is that they can arm you with, with information and ideas about um, to help kind of form your own ideas about what you think about politics and, and equip you to have those discussions with friends and neighbours and, and relatives. Um, so my hope is that you could uh, take up these ideas and talk to people. Uh, when you notice kind of a, a framing in the media that you think is unfair, writing in, putting in a letter to the editor, um, I think we can, uh, and using the worked examples and the testimony we have from major party politicians who've actually experienced governments like these and what their reflections are. Um, just very briefly, if I may, I also noticed a comment uh, in the chat, um, someone from Ireland saying that um, balance of power is pretty normal over there. Um, and that's true. And people might be interested in our paper, Power Sharing Parliaments in Australia, um, where we chart that Australia is really unusual in having as many independents as it does. In other countries with single member electorates, the United States, the United Kingdom, New Zealand and Canada, it's very, very rare to see independents elected. So there's something particular and unusual about the Australian system um, that makes independence possible. One theory is that it's our preferential voting system. Um, and when you look around for other countries with independence, Ireland stands out. Uh, it's not that long ago that Ireland had more independence than all other Western democracies put together. Um, but that's with a proportional representation system. So Australia remains unusual in electing independence from single member electorates. Mm. Oh, thank you, Bill. And thank you so much, everyone, for your excellent questions and for your engagement in the chat. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next time at our webinar on 17 October, when we'll be discussing Australia's gas policy mess with Rod Campbell, our research director. Don't forget to subscribe to the Australia Institute on YouTube to catch all of our webinars. You can also subscribe to our podcast, Follow the Money, Dollars and Cents and After America. And if you're in Sydney, be sure to secure your tickets to see Jose Ramos Horta speak at the Opera House next week. You can find more information on our website. If you have any follow-up questions, you can email us, mail at australiainstitute.org.au. Please put Policy School in the subject. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy our videos, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell button to get notified when we publish a new one. See you next time.